There was a swastika emblazoned on the gun. Am I talking about Nazi Germany circa 1933? Sadly, no, I wish. I'm talking about the United States of America in 2023. Just before 2 p.m. on Saturday, a white man armed with an AR-15 style rifle killed three black people at a Dollar General store in Jacksonville, Florida. At a press conference yesterday evening, Sheriff T.K. Waters said unequivocally that the massacre was a, quote, racially motivated attack and that the shooter left behind multiple diaries, multiple, quote, unquote, manifestos riddled with rabid bigotry. Portions of these manifestos detailed the shooter's disgusting ideology of hate. Plainly put, this shooting was racially motivated and he hated black people. Earlier today, Attorney General Merrick Garland put out a statement saying the Justice Department is investigating this attack as a hate crime and an act of racially motivated violent extremism, and adding that one of the Justice Department's first priorities upon its founding in 1870 was to bring to justice white supremacists who used violence to terrorize black Americans. That remains our urgent charge today. The problem is, though, that it hasn't been an urgent issue, even as white supremacist violence and mass murders have been on the increase. It hasn't been urgent enough, not just for the Justice Department and for law enforcement, both federal and local, but also for the Democratic Party as a whole, for the media as a whole, for the American people as a whole. We haven't taken this issue seriously enough, even as black and brown and Jewish and Muslim bodies pile up, both at home and abroad as a direct result of white supremacist and racist violence. We didn't take it seriously enough after the Charleston Church massacre in June 2015, when a hate-filled sociopath gunned down nine African Americans during a Bible study. We didn't take it seriously enough after the Pittsburgh Synagogue massacre in October 2018, when a racist nutcase killed 11 Jews during Shabbat morning services. We didn't take it seriously enough after the El Paso massacre in August of 2019, when a Latino-hating monster killed 23 people at a Walmart store. We didn't take it seriously enough after the Buffalo shooting in May of last year, when a far-right bigot targeted black people at a top supermarket, killing 10. We didn't take it seriously enough after the Allen, Texas Outlet Mall massacre just this past May, after a man with a swastika tattoo murdered eight people, half of whom were Asian. And now, Jacksonville, Florida. White supremacists armed with AR-15-style rifles gunning down black and brown people, attacking synagogues, setting fire to mosques and black churches. At what point do we say enough is enough? At what point do we ask how we came to live in an America where racist violence is on the rise again, where white supremacists are emboldened again, where mainstream politicians are silent again? And they are silent. Florida governor and presidential candidate Ron DeSantis has strongly condemned the violence in Jacksonville, but he had nothing to say about the far-right ideology behind it, where it comes from, how to stop it. He had nothing to say about the swastika or the weapon of choice. Perpetrating violence of this kind is unacceptable, and targeting people due to their race has no place in the state of Florida. To be clear, I'm not saying that DeSantis or any other top Republican is directly responsible for this or any other racist massacre or directly incited it. What I am saying is that Republicans have created a permissive environment for white supremacists and domestic extremists in this country, have echoed their rhetoric and mainstreamed their talking points. Just take DeSantis. This is the governor who has used black and brown people as political scapegoats, political pawns. Whether it was his arrest of black ex-convicts for daring to vote in Florida, arrests that soon fell apart, or his little game of human hot potato with brown migrants, tricking them onto airplanes and lobbing them across the country to Martha's Vineyard. I mean, this is a guy who fearmongers about critical race theory in Florida schools, who loudly defended a Florida school curriculum which basically both sides slavery and anti-black violence, and who just recently had to fire from his own campaign a staffer who made a video of DeSantis standing in front of a neo-Nazi symbol. Yeah, a neo-Nazi symbol. Is it any wonder that DeSantis' 2018 Democratic opponent in the governor's race famously said this? Now, I'm not calling Mr. DeSantis a racist. I'm simply saying the racists believe he's a racist. Yeah, why is it that the racists and the neo-Nazis love so many of these top conservative politicians and pundits?
Why is it that the Daily Stormer, for example, the neo-Nazi website, said he is literally our greatest ally about former Fox host Tucker Carlson? Why is it that neo-Nazi Richard Spencer led a chant of Heil Trump shortly after the 2016 election? Could it be because Tucker Carlson, night after night on Fox, used neo-Nazi great replacement rhetoric in relation to black and brown migrants? Could it be because Donald Trump campaigned for office by retweeting white supremacists, while in office defended neo-Nazis as very fine people, and since leaving office has hosted a Holocaust denier at Mar-a-Lago for dinner? Oh, and don't even try the, why are you politicizing this, Mehdi? We should be focused only on the person who pulled the trigger and no one else card. I'm Muslim. You don't get to play that card with me or my community. For the past 20 plus years, since 9-11, Muslim communities in this country have been relentlessly questioned, examined, pathologized, scrutinized for the slightest signs of extremism or violence. White conservatives have demanded that brown Muslims subject themselves to extra checks at their places of worship and places of work. White conservatives have asked, where the violence in Muslim communities comes from? What's the ideology behind it? Who are the hate preachers who are radicalizing angry and impressionable young men? They've demanded the Muslim community get their house in order. Well, tonight, this brown Muslim is asking the white conservative community to do the same. Get your house in order. Crack down on the hate preachers who you've empowered and on their foot soldiers who you've emboldened. Condemn the rise of white supremacist ideology, of white supremacist terrorism, and denounce the daily racist outbursts on your cable news channels and your talk radio networks. Oh, and don't hide behind lazy whataboutism about Black Lives Matter and Antifa, neither of whom have ever massacred anyone at a church or a Walmart. But... Perhaps unsurprisingly, that's not what happened on the Sunday morning shows today. Republican presidential candidates didn't want to do any soul searching or self reflection. The politicians didn't want to talk politics. So I don't think this is a left versus right issue, and I don't think we should try to politicize this through partisan goggles either, Chuck. That was an act of evil. Uh, and uh, uh, but I, I and I, our, our prayers are with the families who lost loved ones and those that are injured. Karen and I prayed this morning for them. Mike Pence also went on to say that he wants the death penalty for mass shooters, which is a bizarre thing to say in the wake of a mass shooting, in which the shooter killed himself. He's already dead. But then again, maybe it's not so bizarre, at least insofar as it functions as a smokescreen for Pence to hide behind, to protect him from having to address the actual root causes of white supremacist terror and gun violence. Because, of course, if he actually did that, he'd have to confront nearly every feature and fixture of modern Republican politics, from his former boss, to his allies in conservative media, to even the policies he himself has championed for decades. So considering all that, he dodged. He and every other mainstream Republican politician eagerly leaves that job, time and again, to someone, to anyone else. Which is a shame, but not a shock. But the dead black people in Jacksonville, the dead Asians in Allen, the dead Jews in Pittsburgh, the dead Latinos in El Paso, they deserve better. Joining me now are Melissa Murray, an MSNBC legal analyst and NYU professor of law, and Charles Blow, an MSNBC political analyst and economist for The New York Times. Thank you both for joining me tonight. I wish it wasn't under these circumstances. Uh, Melissa, the shooting yesterday occurred during the commemoration of the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington, where multiple speakers called out the scourge of gun violence as a threat to all Americans, but particularly black Americans. What was your reaction as a black American hearing this horrific news out of Florida yesterday of all days? Well, Mehdi, in that litany of white conservatives who might contribute to this culture of hate through their condemnation of this kind of violence and the rhetoric that, um, that underwrites it, you could also have added the six members of the United States Supreme Court who have also facilitated this through their expansive interpretation of the Second Amendment, the unprecedented expansion of the Second Amendment that really facilitates the keeping and bearing of arms and allows this kind of violence to happen. Just a few weeks after the Buffalo shooting last year, on June 23rd, the court announced its decision in Bruin, a major gun, a major gun rights yes. case, which expanded the scope of the Second Amendment beyond anything that we have seen in the history of this country. So again, Every branch of government is involved in this. Every branch of government has facilitated this. And every branch of government has a role to play in making us more safe and less ideologically terroristic. 
Charles, President Biden was asked today if he's going to speak to Governor DeSantis, uh, given the shooting in Florida. He replied, quote, I'm going to speak with the people of Jacksonville. And I've got to ask about someone like a Ron DeSantis or a Mike Pence. Why can't all these top Republican politicians offer anything, say anything, in response to racist tragedies like Jacksonville or the others I mentioned, beyond thoughts and prayers? I mean, seriously, isn't it time they were forced to address not just their pro-gun policies, but their coziness with white supremacists? Well, you know, we have to go back and look at what the FBI data on hate crimes say about who commits it and who is the targets of it. Uh, the data continue to show that the largest category uh, of targets in a single bias uh, of hate crimes are black people. And the data continue to show that the majority of people who commit these crimes are white people. It is coming primarily in one direction towards one group, and it is coming primarily from another group. But that dynamic implicates the power structure itself by association, right? And they understand that they have, you know, that this, this violence and this uh, environment is scaled. On the one end, you have politicians who create an environment of permissibility. They do so not because they themselves are violent or because they explicitly call for violence, but they, they excuse uh, uh, the, an environment that says it is okay for me to have, be hostile to other people, right? And they do this through what we are seeing through the, these uh, candidates now, refusing to call out white supremacy by, by saying that when black people say that there's a racial, racial issue, a racial problem, they discount the fact that that is a real thing. They say this is an illusion, yes. uh, white supremacy is a myth, and that on one end of the scale helps to create the environment of permissibility. That environment trickles down to the violent people, and so to call them out is to implicate themselves. Yes, very much so. And we're going beyond permissibility. Melissa, we're now entering in the world of victim blaming. GOP presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy said this on Meet the Press today. Have a listen. And I am genuinely worried that we're seeing a new wave of anti-black and anti-Hispanic racism just so you, just as so you a know, consequence your of the so-called anti-racist movements. That is an astonishing and astonishingly offensive thing to say. Is it not irresponsible, too, in the wake of a mass shooting? Obviously, I mean, I don't know that I would expect less at this point. I mean, it is to their advantage because they are the party that has advanced this muscular interpretation of the Second Amendment. They are the party that insists upon making guns available, even in circumstances where the democratic process would require that the people have a say and the people have decided that they would want more limited access to guns, especially for those who might be dangerous to certain elements of the community. But they insist that the access to guns, the keeping and bearing of guns must be unfettered, must be completely completely free and subject to very, very few limitations. So I'm not entirely surprised by this. I'm not surprised by the effort to blame these victims and these families who have been terrorized and to blame everyone who is probably wondering at this point in time whether that will be turned on them. Because again, as Charles says, the data makes clear who are the targets of these racially motivated attacks. And it is often people of color, black people, people who are the most vulnerable in our society. Charles, more than a decade ago in 2009, Obama's first year in office, his Department of Homeland Security sent American law enforcement agencies an intelligence briefing warning of a rising threat of domestic right-wing extremism, including white supremacist terrorism. Republican politicians reacted with outrage. They demanded a retraction. They got one. Obama's head of DHS publicly apologized, and that team of analysts who produced that report was disbanded. Clearly, in hindsight, a crazy mistake, but also just a broader point. Liberals have been on the defensive about the rise of white supremacy for far too long, have they not? They've been far too worried about offending conservatives who often play the victim on this. Right. It is worrying about offending them. But it's also this there's a sheepishness when it comes to dealing with white people when it on this issue of of terror, right? It, we don't treat them. You put, said this in your intro about how we have treated the Muslim community. They went so far as to do things that were outright unconstitutional with Muslim communities searching for and trying to ferret out terrorists. They, we don't treat these 
people who are also terrorists in the same way. And the only reason that we don't do that is because they are white people and white people are still the majority or, the, or in some states a plurality in this country. That is the only reason. And until we are honest about why we are not doing this, we don't need to dance around whether or not it's a partisan issue, it's a polling issue, it's conservatives. No, it, the only reason that we are not doing this is because these are white people and white people are still the majority of this country. And, and a lot of white people do not want the association that, that there's a, a problem in the community that needs to be ferreted out. And it has nothing to do with most white people. The vast majorities of any group of people, racial, ethnic, religious, yes. are not committing violent crime and they're not committing hate crimes. It's not about all of anyone. But there is a problem in the data, in the community, and we have to be upfront about where the, where the problem is and how we do that, how we deal with that, and stop pulling our punches about it.